Um, good afternoon, friends. Uh, welcome to the 29th JP Nayak Memorial Lecture, which is an annual event of the Center for Women's Development Studies. And we are doing it for the 29th time. So you can see that it's an established uh, institutional practice. And it's nice that we can now do it in the physical mode. One has become so used to the online mode that it feels a bit funny to be actually seeing people in their physical mode. So um, the JP Nayak lecture uh, is in honor of uh, Pandurang, Jain Pandurang Nayak, who was a renowned educationist and Gandhi, Gandhian educationist. And um, among his many positions that he held, and he was a public figure of uh, eminence. And uh, some of the positions that he held were being uh, the member secretary of the Indian Council of Social Science Research between 1969 and 1978. And he was very instrumental in supporting uh, you know, the formation and all uh, kind of support logistical and intellectual to the committee which was set up in the early 70s to for the state uh, the committee on the status of uh, of women in india of which the founding members of cwds like uh, professor veena the late professor veena majundar and uh, the late professor latika sarkar among others were members so he was a person who was at a time when women's studies and the women's question was really invisible particularly in public policy particularly in public policy uh, he was quite a tra trailblazer of that time and we consider him as one of our founding members of the cwds and uh, it's in honor of his, uh, in his memory and, uh, you know, to his contribution uh, that we are dedicating this lecture. And every year we have a distinguished speaker come and talk about, uh, talk about an issue that is uh, relevant in the area of women and gender studies and which has uh, ex as extreme salience for the center's research work. And today's topic on prenatal selection with the provocative title, uh, will it ever stop, is really something that was, uh, has been a, a, you know, a, a, an issue that has run through the whole uh, period of, from the 1980s onwards when CWDS uh, was formed. Uh, and it's been uh, preoccupying us all these years. So it's quite an honor to have Professor Gyoma to, to talk about that to us. And uh, with that, uh, I welcome you again. Um, may I ask uh, Nain Tara to uh, present the bookie to our distinguished speaker? And uh, now may I request Professor Vasanti Raman uh, to formally welcome you and to tell us about our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Well, uh, friends, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have our uh, speaker today. Is it okay? Yeah. Uh, on a theme which has been a concern of CWDS ever since its inception, as uh, uh, Reno has pointed out, the whole question of uh, sex determination. At that time, it was more, it was uh, declining sex ratios. And uh, and we've had many persons who have been associated in various capacities with CWDS working on this theme. And uh, we have Sabu George here, who has been a passion for him for the last 40 years or so. And uh, so the themes that uh, we are so delighted to have Professor Kristoff here. There are many things. I'm not going to really talk about the number of things he's done, but just want to highlight one thing. He is currently a senior fellow in demography at the French Institute de Recherche pour le Développement, attached to uh, CEPED Research Unit in Paris. And he has joined. Yes? Can, were you saying something? No. And, uh, 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 and he has, uh, has been working on the demography of inequalities. 
there are many things he's been working also. He worked for a while at the Madras Institute of Development Studies at Pondicherry. And his work uh, has really looked at a whole range of issues relating to sex selection, sex determination, starting with, and he's looked at India's and China's experience. His current work also covers Southeast Asia, the Caucasus, and uh, Southeast Europe. But what is interesting to my mind is that the focus is the demography of inequalities and how these issues relate the issue of sex selection uh, and sex inequalities, sex gender-based inequalities are all so inextricably linked. I mean, so I'm not going to say anything more, and I leave uh, uh, the floor to Christophe Guillermoto. Uh, we look forward to, uh, and I do hope we are going to get a written presentation, which we will soon print. Thank you, uh, Professor Rahman. Um, I would like first to thank um, uh, Professor Adlaka and the Executive Committee of the Center for Women, uh, Women's Development Studies for this invitation. Uh, it came uh, at the right moment for, for, for me because I'm in the process of um, completing my work, which I started maybe uh, 15 years ago, about sex selection across the year, uh, across the world, it uh, in fact it started in in Salem, uh, and that's why I was discussing uh, about Salem with uh, one of our guests, um, maybe 25 years ago or 30 years ago, and it was all about infanticide. And uh, little did we know that already at that time, uh, prenatal sex selection had emerged uh, in Tamil Nadu and in the rest of India. But uh, what I'm going to discuss with you is uh, why uh, would sex selection, uh, which is so convenient for families when they want to reshape and manipulate the gender composition of their children, why, why should it be, why should it disappear? Mm -hmm. In fact, I um, tend to be pretty uh, optimistic, and the answer is that it's going to disappear. And the second question, which I'm not going to answer uh, adequately, is why at all? Is it finally uh, going to vanish? But let me uh, start uh, with um, maybe with uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, so should I go there? Yeah. So first, uh, I will briefly uh, tell you about the kind of evidence we have and uh, show you that it wasn't actually very easy at the beginning uh, to demonstrate uh, on the presence of sex imbalances at birth and then how we could make sense of them, especially in view of the fact that they appeared almost simultaneously across the world, uh, even in Eastern Europe or in Eastern, I mean, from Eastern Europe to Eastern Asia. And then the main question is, what's happening today and can we predict the evolution of uh, sex imbalances at birth? And finally, how do we look at trends and how, in fact, trends are going to tell us what's uh, happening? 
So let me start with, uh, with the beginning. The first person who talked to me uh, about the sex ratio at birth was a colleague who, was, uh, who, who died uh, a few years later who said that she had worked on a very, very uh, boring topic for a PhD, the sex ratio at birth. And it's true that it was very uh, unexciting uh, for demographers because the sex ratio at birth is mostly determined by uh, biology. It's around uh, 100 male births per 100 uh, female births. So here I'm going to use the international um, convention, uh, which is uh, measuring uh, uh, in terms of male per female births and not the uh, Indian uh, way. And uh, there were oscillations, you know, I mean, variations across uh, continents, but very small. And uh, in fact, it was studied mostly by statisticians because they, they needed huge data sets in order to monitor very small changes. Some of these changes could be short-term uh, variations. Sometimes there was uh, more male births after a crisis, but just for a few months, sometimes even for uh, just a few weeks. And then there were also long-term trends, but hardly visible uh, by anybody but uh, statisticians, because they were very small. And still today, there are lots of papers published on these short-term or long-term uh, variations, but very little by way of explanation. You'd be surprised to see that we don't know why it is rising or decreasing. Uh, but in fact, the sex ratio at birth, I see it as part of a larger, uh, what I would call the demographic regime, especially the reproductive regime, in which you have much more important dimensions, like, for example, marriage patterns, fertility rates, age at reproduction. And so the number of female or, or females or males among births is just a, a very uh, negligible uh, component of this regime. And within the, you have also in mean, the reproductive uh, landscape also includes uh, the policy environment, technological supply, gender and family norms, and many other. Uh, so nobody really took care of uh, sex ratio at birth precisely because it was mostly stable and um, uh, unchanging. And uh, when we finally started to see stuff, it was mostly because there were either too many births, when births were uh, too many male births, when uh, male and female births were properly measured, which is not always the case, for it's not, not the case really in India, or when there were too many boys among children. And so the first sign uh, appeared in South Korea, where they have a a, a better uh, birth registration system, and then later, uh, at about the same time, in India and China, where uh, there was uh, too many, apparently too many boys among children, uh, among the child population. And they were also indirect signs by anthropologists, uh, by uh, uh, um, people who had done feed work and had shown that there was real enthusiasm uh, for uh, prenatal diagnosis. And that women, especially there was a, a study in, uh, in Mumbai uh, showing that uh, women really welcomed uh, prenatal diagnosis as a way to decide about uh, their pregnancy. And they were eager to know whether they were expecting uh, 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 boys or, or girls. But then there was, and I think it's part of the story, there was a lot of resistance of people denying the presence of prenatal sex selection. So first, there were countries where nobody noticed anything. They didn't uh, observe that there were too many male births. And there is still one country in Southeast Europe where there's been no official recognition of sex imbalances uh, at birth, 
which started in the 1990s, so almost 30 years ago, or 30 years later, still they don't know it's happening or they don't want to. Then you, we had another type of uh, reaction, which is, yes, it's happening, but it's an illusion, it's a data issue. It's a, it's, uh, data are wrong, and they don't show what you believe. So it, it took another year, I mean, a couple of years for demographers and statisticians to compare data and say, no, obviously they are too many. And then the third type of uh, resistance was, yes, it's happening, but it has nothing to do with gender. It has to do with some, for instance, unique biological uh, characteristic of our population. Uh, for example, in India, there were papers published showing, trying to show that finally in India, the natural sex ratio at birth is different. Yeah. We have more. And I've heard the same story, um, I think 10 years ago, for instance, in Kosovo. People would say that, well, Kosovo is different, you know, there are just more boys being born here, full stop. Well, not exactly. Uh, so. And there were other uh, alternative explanations. One uh, that uh, got a lot of publicity was about hepatitis B. That hepatitis B was responsible, especially in China, for the excess number of male births. I mean, all that just was wrong, you know. And uh, there were too many. Uh, uh, too many male births just because some uh, girls were not allowed to, to be born. And so when you look at the, uh, at the map, there are several countries which were affected. I've put also the date of the onset of sex imbalances at, at birth. So, for instance, you see India, Nepal, uh, Vietnam, uh, China, South Korea. And also in Eastern Europe, you see a couple of small countries in the South uh, Caucasus region, and also uh, closer to, to my country um, in Albania and countries around um, Albania. And when you look at the numbers, uh, you should have around 105 or 106 uh, male births per uh, 100 female births. And we see that in many countries, listed here, except South Korea, uh, you have an excess number of male births. And this is due to the fact that uh, some, uh, uh, due to the uh, to sex selective abortion that prevented uh, uh, girls from uh, being born. Now, when we came to trying to explain this, uh, the challenge was that all these countries had very little in common. You know, uh, look at, for example, some of the dimensions that I've listed here in terms of religion. You have almost all religion on on Earth, or all religions on Earth, um, including atheism. Maybe I've not never measured it among Jews, so apparently it's not common uh, uh, among them. But otherwise. It's every, almost everywhere. Political systems, you know, from China to Albania to India to Nepal, it's, they have nothing in common. Uh, Socio-economic development, some of these countries are, have booming economies, like, say, Vietnam or, or India. In other countries, uh, other countries are even rich uh, uh, developed level, like South Korea. And some of the countries went through a complete economic uh, transition, uh, post-communist transition in Eastern Europe. So no uh, common feature. The role of state may be very strong in India or in China or in Vietnam. Uh, it's more the role of markets, which, we, which would be blamed uh, in South Korea or in South Asia, maybe more families and, uh, and kinship. Marriage systems also are very different. Uh, most countries have individual choices, but arranged marriages are common in South Asia. You have bride price, for instance, in, uh, in, in, in part of China. You have dowry uh, in uh, most part of India, or nothing at all in Eastern Europe. 
But what we see is that there is very strong micro, what I call micro-regional uh, homogeneity, like for example in India, where you have sex imbalances uh, uh, at birth mostly uh, towards the western states, you know, from Punjab to Gujarat and uh, Maharashtra. And, um, but sometimes you cross the border and there, there are no more sex imbalances at birth. So it's very surprising. For example, you are in North Vietnam, you cross the mountain, reach Laos, no more sex imbalances. Same when you are in Albania, you go towards Serbia. In Serbia, there is nothing like sex imbalances at birth. So it's very, very puzzling. And then uh, each country tried to project its own local narrative. They had a story. It has to be a unique story for, for example, in India. Remember, it's mostly about dowry, but it's also a little bit about economic liberalization. In China or in Vietnam, it's about family planning policies, or locally they interpret it rather in different way. They will blame uh, superstitions, that is, traditions. Um, South Korea, it was more about the patriarchal family system. And in Eastern Europe, it was most about economic disruption or war or uh, conflicts and sometimes even male migration, like for example in Armenia. But finally, uh, we see that there are three uh, dimensions that are always found uh, in countries affected by uh, sex imbalances at birth. So the first one is obvious, it's sound preference. People do that for a reason. Um, they want to, uh, to ensure the birth of a son, sometimes even the birth of two sons. Uh, and so they have to do something, especially because, and this is the second condition, fertility is low. So they don't want to have additional children in order to ensure male birth. So they have to, there is a trade-off uh, between uh, uh, low fertility and your gender uh, constraints. And then obviously there is a third, what I would call a supply uh, dimension uh, to that story, and that's the fact that there is a technology to respond to your needs. You will be able to know in advance the sex of your child, and that has appeared in the 1970s uh, in the West, and it has spread everywhere uh, after that. And coupled with this uh, prenatal diagnosis, coupled with um, abortion, allows you to reshape the gender composition of your family. Then what we see is that we are moving from one reproductive regime to another one. So the first one is on the left and says basically that you will go by the biological sex ratio at birth. You know, there's nothing you can do about it. And then the next one will allow you to have more uh, uh, boys in order to, I mean, it's not that everybody does it, of course, but a share of the population will be able to manipulate um, the gender of their children, especially of their last child. Uh, after having, for example, two girls or three girls, they will be able to uh, ensure the birth of, uh, of, uh, of a son. But whatever the case, so you move from one equilibrium to another one. And this is what we've seen, for instance, take uh, Azerbaijan, you know. So we have uh, a long series of data. It's around 107 or something. It was probably too high in those days because people just forgot to register the birth of girls. And it decreased a little bit closer to what we expect, 105. And then all of a sudden, uh, after independence of uh, um, Azerbaijan, that is in uh, 1991, uh, the sex ratio at birth uh, will um, uh, jump towards 119 or 118, one of the highest value in the world. And it was mostly 
a time when market, where, when the state almost collapsed in the former Soviet Union, and the state was able to provide people with insurance, with housing, with uh, work, with uh, free health services, and all of a sudden there was uh, this withdrawal of the state, and so people had to rely on, uh, on families, and then rediscover that sons were at the core of uh, family. And as you can see, the sex ratio at birth plateaued after 10 years in, uh, in um, Azerbaijan, as if it was reaching a new equilibrium. That's what also uh, we, we were able to detect in, uh, in, in Vietnam uh, over a much shorter period, and you see a sex ratio going from 107 to 112 uh, within, say, five or, or 10 years. And it looks like it's a diffusion of a new uh, practice, uh, new technology, but also sex selection as some kind of innovation going uh, um, diffusing, di being disseminated uh, through the population. So now we understand pretty well the emergence. I mean, there are some details that I'm not giving here, you here, but the challenge is to look at the predictions. What can we guess about the future of prediction? Now, people in my line of business are usually really reasonably good at predicting trends, you know, uh, compared to other social scientists. Uh, for example, you think of fertility decline or uh, life expectancy, urbanization, you know. It's sometimes pretty easy to predict because it's moving upward or downward, and you just have to continue the trend to guess what, where you are going to, to be after five years or 10 years. So that's pretty, uh, pretty easy, and um, it doesn't take, I mean, it's not real uh, rocket science to predict what fertility rates may be in five years, say. But they did, uh, demographers uh, did fail to predict the emergence of sex imbalances at birth. So how would they be able to predict uh, the future of sex imbalances at birth, whether they will persist or even further deteriorate or increase or finally disappear. And here I'll tell you again why it is difficult, because when trends are linear, they are straight, well, that's, at least for short-term prediction, it's pretty easy. You know, you just have to project the same kind of linear uh, evolution. And it's what we, we are doing. We, you can do that with population aging, with uh, many indicators. Just draw a line. Maybe after five years or 10 years, you have to change a little bit the slope of the line. Or maybe it's plateauing, but at least you know where you're going. Now, for the sex ratio at birth, uh, if it is at all going to decrease, then we have what is called a, a, a non-linear linear, uh, shift, that is a rise and a fall. It could be a fall and a rise. And that is pretty difficult to uh, predict. Why so? Because you don't know what kind of factors are going to affect both the rise and maybe later on on the fall, the decrease. Is it the same factors that should explain uh, um, trends in different uh, direction? Or do you have to imagine that there are other factors coming, um, coming up and explaining the reversal of the trend? Now, if we go back to the, the factors, uh, the, the preconditions of uh, sex imbalances at birth, we can see that the first two are unlikely to affect uh, sex imbalances at birth. For instance, starting with technology, uh, sex selection technology, 
it's still improving as we speak, so, and it's not going to, to disappear, even with strong policy uh, uh, measures. So people will more and more, it will be more and more uh, easy for people, easier and easier for people um, to um, predict uh, the, the sex of their birth. And so that we cannot expect any improvement on that. About low fertility, we don't expect also any rebound of fertility rising all of a sudden. And that's what people expected a little bit in China, but it's not happening. Even after dismantling the so-called one-child policy, uh, there's been no rebound in birth rates. And so, for instance, in India, birth rates are falling, and maybe they will plateau at a low level, like, for example, they do in Kerala, but we don't expect any rebound back to, say, for instance, uh, three children per, per woman, where we were uh, just uh, 15 years ago. So it's only the last factor, sun preference, that may affect the trend. And here there are some explanations, which are, are just hypotheses. One is that sun preference may be, may be reduced by increased uh, female uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, autonomy, due to education or employment and, and stuff like that. Uh, it could be also uh, due to of an overall uh, economic improvement uh, through market mechanism, poverty reduction, and also uh, government policies. And there is a certain explanation that in itself an excess of male birth or male population may be just socially unsustainable, and that there will be a correction later on, especially due to the impact of the so-called marriage squeeze when there are too many uh, men on the, uh, on the marriage market compared to women. So anyway, that's the standard uh, hypothesis, is that technology, fertilities will have no uh, positive impact, but it's only the decline in some preference that may ultimately affect the sex ratio at birth and cause a decline that is a return to normalcy um, with uh, disappearance of uh, sun preference. Now, why would sun preference disappear? You know? Now, the first question is why is there sun preference? Lots of discussion, but basically the major factor is kinship, kinship system. And so you have uh, in India or in Albania or, or in, in Vietnam, a kinship system um, characterized by both patrilocality, people uh, live with their married um, son, for instance, and uh, patrilineality that are uh, uh, goods and names everything on the, the, the family is perpetuated through the patri line and that women uh, join another family after marriage. So that is what we find in, in India or in part of, um, parts of Nepal, uh, but something that we don't find, for instance, in Laos or in Serbia. And that's why uh, there's no reason for sound preference. So, so this is due to kinship. Then the second question is, where does kinship come from? And then people have explanation, but uh, they have explanation related to, uh, uh, um, to um, uh, dimensions that were observed sometimes centuries ago. Like, for example, uh, pastoralism, or uh, plow uh, cultivation, or even types of soil. Uh, so it's unlikely to change. And anyway, it's just uh, our kinship is mostly inherited you know, and reproduced uh, by tradition, but with, with no uh, 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 specific functional uh, reasons. So, in fact, there is no uh, power theory for explaining shifts in kinship. That's pretty surprising. 
and especially because we have uh, uh, witnessed uh, important kin kinship uh, transformations also in Europe, probably in the 19th centuries. But you would be surprised. The literature has lost little to say about the factors, the reason that were uh, behind the um, gradual disappearance of patriarchy in, uh, in Europe. Um, uh, so we just can say it's social change, uh, modernization, a reduced role of families, uh, uh, but very little by way of uh, demonstration. And here again, uh, I've worked a little bit on the European experience. That is, here I mean mostly Western Europe, not the Balkans or the countries that are still affected by sex imbalances at birth. And we've seen some, disappear, uh, some preference disappear, uh, notably in Germany or in northern Italy, parts of Spain. We don't know why. Again, there are some blanket explanation, like, uh, female employment or uh, uh, urbanization, industrialization, but no, no proof, no proof. And that's very unfortunate because we would like to be uh, able to apply the experience of uh, West uh, European countries to the rest of, uh, I mean, to countries currently affected by uh, sex imbalances at birth. But uh, or as far as the research has uh, advanced so far. No, we cannot do that. We can. So we have to go back to the trend and then look at them carefully and especially look at the case of South Korea where we've seen a rise, you know, uh, excess male births, very rapid, starting from the 1980s, but then it peaked and it stayed at a plateau level for maybe five to less than 10 years. And then it started decreasing. And it didn't decrease regularly. You know, there were ups and downs. But finally, uh, after 20 years, it was back to normal level. And so the issue of sex imbalances at birth, uh, this issue has completely disappeared uh, uh, from uh, South Korea to the point that our South Korean colleagues don't want to work on, on that. It's, for them, it's like a um, historical demography. It has nothing, with, nothing to do with today's uh, South Korea. But still, we, we have looked at the past potential reason uh, for the decline in, of sex imbalances in South Korea. Again, you'll find a couple of standard reasons, you know, increase in education, uh, better employment opportunities, rising prosperity, uh, what South Korean sociologists call compressed modernity, uh, changes in family laws, which were very important um, in the 1980s in, um, in South Korea, and also government introduction uh, go government in, uh, intervention with a ban of uh, prenatal diagnosis and a few doctors uh, losing their license in the 1990s. But uh, in fact, uh, none of these factors explain why it started to decrease in the 1990s. A lot of these things that I'm describing are true uh, for the entire period. They should have affected uh, gender attitudes before the uh, 1990s, except for uh, government policies that were introduced when the sex ratio at birth was most uh, skewed. Uh, but people who have done research have said, and here I'm not done it, but I go by the literature, they say that in fact this government uh, intervention had very, very little impact. And one proof of that is that in those days, abortion was legally uh, not permissible in, uh, in South Korea, and that nobody cared. There were lots of abortions. So the government, in fact, uh, the, the intervention uh, uh, of the government was quite limited, had quite limited impact. Anyway, when you look at the data again here, on the last column, I've put an uh, arrow to show the, the trend, and you will see that it's either flat, 
that's stabilizing or it's uh, decreasing, that is, coming back to normalcy, almost everywhere. So what we see is uh, an apparent global decline in sex imbalances at birth. So you know now about South Korea, <coughs> that is now back to normal, uh, and that the highest level now has reduced to 114, and it's in Azerbaijan, it's no more in, in China, because in China there is a sustained uh, improvement in the sex ratio at birth for at least eight years. And everywhere else it's, in, it's improving. Uh, we just have some local evidence in some regions, including in India, where there might be a deterioration happening today. That's about all we can see. Otherwise, it's declined. Now, what is so special with the trains is that they are uh, somewhat regular. They look, uh, <coughs> they look like they follow kind of pattern. And to show you that, I've put the same data of the sex ratio at birth, but not by year. Uh, but I've show, uh, I'm going to show them to you by year from the start of the onset of sex imbalances at birth, like there is a year zero. And this is what you see. It is always rising, and then after some, some time, it reaches an, uh, an apex, a maximum level, a plateau, and then finally, it may uh, decrease. I mean, it may. In most cases, it decreases. I've put only some countries for which I have re I mean, reasonably reliable annual estimates. And unfortunately, that doesn't include India, for which you don't have good uh, annual estimates. So what we know now is that we can recognize some common patterns with the sex ratio rising, or the sex ratio after a while uh, going through some uh, a, a real downturn and coming back to, to normal. And there are certain uh, things that we don't see, like, for example, a decline. Uh, that is, excess number of female births. We never see that. A rebound <laughs> that after a while the sex ratio will deteriorate even further or a permanent new equilibrium. And that's what we would expect. You know, that's what I also showed you at the beginning of my presentation, that maybe it's, there should be a new equilibrium with 5% too many uh, boys, but people are happy with that, and it's OK, and it is the new normal. No, it's very unstable, because after a while, it, shows to, uh, it is shown to, um, to decrease. And now you can look again at South Korea, and you clearly see the rapid rise, you know, the diffusion of sex selection through the country. It was pretty rapid because South Korea is ethnically very homogeneous and is a very small country and well-connected. So it took less than 10 years. Then a plateau, but then uh, unexpectedly a decline uh, in, uh, from the mid-1990s and a very slow decline, much slower than the initial uh, rise. Now, uh, let's see what the statisticians have to say. And uh, every two or three years, the United Nations uh, publishes um, uh, um, a report about the state of the world's population and provides uh, estimates for each and every country for the last 50 years, but also for the next uh, 80 years. That is up to 2000, uh, um, to, for up to 2100. And to do that, they need to have estimates of the sex ratio at birth, especially for India and China. So they need to project it. And what they are using now, it's called the Bayesian method. And the Bayesian method is 
very, I mean, statistically very demanding, but intellectually very simple. You use every past evidence of sex imbalances at birth, and then you use them to produce the future pattern. So again, it's very easy when, it come, when it's about mortality uh, decline, because again, it's mostly linear. So everything you see is coming down. I mean, may not be coming down because of COVID or because AIDS crisis in Africa. But on the whole, it's gently coming down. So you can apply that trend to other countries and say that it's going to improve also in Afghanistan or in Bolivia or in Timor-Leste, countries that, are, that have low uh, life expectancy. Fine. But for sex ratio at birth, it's again more uh, trickier because it's nonlinear. So you cannot just project this way. So what my colleagues have done is that since they have no way to really uh, project nonlinear trends, they had to assume it. And if you go to uh, uh, the annal, I don't remember, the annal of applied statistics, I mean, it's not a journal uh, you, you would read uh, um, every day, you will find this, that they have said that the sex ratio at birth should follow this pattern. <coughs> so they've taken this pattern from work that I did, but not as a statistician, just as a demographer. And now they are forcing that onto future trends. And um, this is what we see, for instance, for China. So it's very smooth, because China doesn't have a really a reliable uh, annual estimate. So they have smoothed it. And look how it, uh, it, it just looks like a bell. And for India, it's more irregular. But if you look at the uh, right part, which are projections uh, over the next uh, 20 or 30 years, you see that it's much smoother and that every, everything is going to come back to normal. In fact, I've done this exercise with colleagues. And applying this model, no surprise, you know, everything is improving, you know. and. Uh, that's what is now published in, by the United Nations. You will see sex ratio at birth is supposed to come down to normal values, normal, what I mean, natural biological uh, levels. And that is true for any country from Albania to Vietnam. And within 20 years or 25 years, sex ratio at birth. Uh, the only caveat to this is that in some countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, or it could be in, in Afghanistan, there might be sex imbalances at birth in the future in view of the strengths of patriarchal values and the fact that today fertility is still very high, so people don't care, uh, don't need to care about the birth of the son. They, they will have one uh, through repeated uh, childbearing. Uh, so, that's part of the prediction that maybe the situation might deteriorate in 30 years from now in certain countries in the world. But otherwise, everything looked good. So how do we make sense of that? You know, well, Again, we have no explanation. We are just looking at the data. But there is something that at least uh, people like me see through the data, and what is called a cycle or a transitional cycle. Uh, because we recognize that there is the rise, the stabilization, and then somehow that the system, the new regime, is unsustainable. And so by itself, it will self-correct. And you would uh, return to a normal level of sex ratio at birth. Now we see, we, we see that in other... Um, uh, in other demographic uh, events. For instance, you have the rise and the fall uh, of uh, crisis mortality, you know, which we have seen uh, just two years ago in India. Deaths were increasing, especially in Delhi. But we knew that at some point it would 
plateau and then disappear. It's always the same with uh, epidemics. Mm -hmm. So rise and then fall by itself. We've seen it also with the demographic transition. Yes, the population was growing very fast because of mortality decline. And then after some time, almost everywhere, and when I say almost everywhere, it's in fact now everywhere, you see that population growth <coughs> will finally start uh, decreasing because of fertility decline. And that's what's happening everywhere, for instance, in India. I mean, it's, the cycle is almost over in South India, but it's still going on in, say, North India, uh, with fertility uh, levels already quite low. So you can expect uh, growth rates uh, to uh, fall to zero within uh, 20 years. Uh, we have the same also about migration. You know, the fact that I was talking about Kerala. Kerala, of course, is known for exporting migrants. But part of the cycle uh, is that at the end, they will import workers. And that we can see in, uh, in Kerala. But we see it in other countries. Uh, here I've listed Malaysia, Italy, Spain. They have uh, uh, exported a lot of their labor force, and now they are importing from neighboring countries. So it's part of the, uh, of, uh, of the cycle. So uh, the question is then, uh, does it mean that the turnaround in sex imbalances at birth is endogenous? Endogenous means it comes from within and not from outside, you know? Because we wanted to believe, mostly, that it was due to external factors, like improvements, for instance, in um, women's status, or improvement, economic, overall uh, economic improvement, or, or the penetration of uh, market uh, forces, or the rule of law, or whatever. But um, it looks like the, the, the transition um, is caused by itself, you know? And that's why we believe it's mostly endogenous. Take two potential dimensions of this uh, transformation. Uh, first, the policy responses, the fact that governments in most of these countries have finally uh, started to intervene to, to try to, uh, for example, uh, correct uh, economic or social imbalances between boys and girls through different uh, instruments. They are very, uh, um, uh, very varied uh, across the world, but here I've listed some of them um, better known for China and, and India. And another dimension is that the mere uh, uh, demographic unsustainability of uh, uh, excess male births. And that's mostly due to the merit system, which is affected through what we call the merit squeeze, what's happening right now as we speak in India or China. The fact that there are more men trying to marry than women, and so the, 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 the merit system is going to be deeply, uh, deeply um, impacted. So here we recognize uh, what are called uh, self-correcting uh, uh, mechanism or also homeostasis, the capacity of a system to self-regulate you know, without external um, influence. So here is the story uh, in a few <coughs> words. So at the beginning, we see uh, the role of market forces and also state penetration, but not everywhere, uh, that facilitated fertility decline and also the spread of new reproductive technology. Uh, but there were kinship constraints, very strong, that required uh, sex selection to ensure uh, the birth of sons uh, in smaller families. But then this excess male births converted into marriage squeeze that in turn uh, weaken patriarchal norms, because what if you have had a boy, but the boy is not able to marry, so the entire patriarchal uh, contract is uh, questioned, uh, 
And so you will have to, to rely on, on your uh, daughters, in fact, for family reproduction. That's some, some work that we've done uh, with uh, Mary John about it, who did have no time to show, uh, documents that. But then the last uh, episode is that market and state forces finally uh, provide new uh, instruments that will weaken uh, kinship system and the reliance on, uh, on family. And it's mainly uh, you know, the labor market, housing market, marriage choice, legal framework, uh, old age support. Everything that can, where families can, uh, at the end of the day, be substituted with market or state um, uh, instruments. At least what we can see now is that we, we, we can put each and every country or region on this kind of chart and see where they are and where they are likely to be. Sometimes we don't know exactly where they are. For example, for Nepal, we don't have very good uh, um, uh, estimates. And we see that for South Korea or for countries like uh, Georgia or Singapore, that's the end of the, uh, uh, of the journey. But it's not yet uh, finished in Vietnam or in India, in most of India. So conclusion uh, is that there are certain things that we know very clearly on the millions of girls that were uh, not allowed to, to, to be born, uh, the, the equality number of, uh, number of men who are not going to be able to marry uh, the way they want in the future, but we still have no theory about the decline of sex selection and shifts in uh, kinship system. Uh, we don't know exactly what kind of endogenous factors account for the somewhat uh, unescapable, unescapable uh, turnaround in the sex ratio at birth. Uh, we don't know the contribution of the policies to that uh, turnaround, you know. Uh, because we've seen, for example, decline, I mean, improvement in the sex ratio at birth in Georgia, where there's been absolutely no policy targeting uh, prenatal sex selection. So we don't know whether policies have been really effective. And uh, we don't know also how come the marriage squeeze as a threat impacted on the behavior of people, how they anticipated that uh, having a marrying boys may be very difficult in the, in the future because, I mean, I don't think they are demographic experts, so how come people uh, knew in advance and were able to somehow uh, decide to give up sex selection because that's what's happening? Uh, so these are questions, and uh, so I'll be very happy to have uh, your observation about my presentation, but also uh, your uh, ideas or suggestions about the factors explaining the improvements uh, that we uh, see today and that we foresee for the futures. For the future, thank you. much for a really uh, stimulating presentation. I think there are many people already waiting to ask questions. So, Bina. Okay. Bina. Um, firstly, thank you, Christoph. That was uh, very, very, very interesting. Um, so my uh, focus is really your uh, arguing that it's, uh, it's endogenous. Uh, and I'd like to suggest uh, several aspects which for your consideration. Um, policies are never endogenous in any case. I feel that if you take India and many other countries, uh, the women's movement needs to be factored in the directions in which policies are pushed. Uh, so I would consider that as exogenous rather than endogenous. Um, but what I want to suggest is, um, is the following, that um, changes in kinship. Now, if we unpackage kinship, there are several elements to it apart from tracing the bloodline, which can't change. Uh, one is inheritance, 
The other you talked about patrilocality. The third aspect is the assumption of um, parents being looked after in old age. Now on inheritance, we find that it, as, as far as the legal system is concerned, in most countries, it's moved towards greater equality. I mean, certainly that's the case in South Asia. It's very much the case in India. The second is that patrilocality um, hugely gets undermined uh, when you have urbanization. So this idea you can't marry somebody in the same village, or you know, girls following boys and so on, neither of them is necessarily living uh, with the original extended family. So you may have patrilocality of the girl going where the boy's um, job is, but then girls might would also be uh, getting jobs. Um, what's also interesting, and I found it by looking at, you know, this, there's this whole discussion about uh, women do all the care work, and now they're going to do all the uh, care for the elderly if they have fewer children. And what was interesting was that if you look at the figures of joint families in India, in the NFHS, it was 16%, astonishingly low. So clearly, uh, that aspect of son preference, children looking after you in old age, et cetera, is hugely declined. Now, whether it's poor families who can't keep everybody together, or it's middle class families whose children are studying abroad, uh, they're not there to look after you in old age. So what I'm suggesting is that the unpackaging of kinship as a factor in son preference, if you disaggregate it, it's already unpackaged in a variety of ways inheritance, patrilocality, looking after old age. The second um, aspect is that technology replaces male labor. So suppose we take a transition from rural to urban, from agriculture to industry, uh, you find that whether it's female labor, male labor, technology um, is replacing it. Now, one way it replaces it is, of course, um, heavy operations like in agriculture, you have tractorization, mechanization, and so on, which, is, which has been happening since the 60s, but especially happened after the mid-70s, um, everywhere. And the other is that uh, in you know, uh, other technologies where you don't need physical labor, where women can be employed, has been exponentially improving. So this issue about um, you know, women's um, work, I mean, apart from the complex question of women's labor force participation in India, but you're looking at it globally, is that the reason for son preference, where sons do uh, take over the farm and so on, that's been, you know, that's been declining uh, over time. So I wondered how you would, uh, you would see that. Uh, and the third is social norms, uh, which, uh, which have been changing um, as well. And much, much of this, I would argue, is really exogenously driven. Uh, rather than uh, implicit in a, in a demographic transition endogenous argument that uh, that I as thought you were making. So thanks. Uh, can we take one or two more questions so that you can then, uh, or would you like to take um, up? Maybe I'll, uh, I'll respond. Yes, OK. Uh, because uh, Bina told me she, she, she was going to leave. Um, well, uh, I, I think we need a longer conversation on that. And um, I recognize uh, many important items in your <coughs> kind of laundry list of positive factors uh, that are exogenous. Well, I, I may not agree about to policy uh, dimension, because I think it's partly endogenous. It was caused by sex selection in the first place. It didn't come from, uh, from elsewhere. But um, the thing is that, yes, everything that you're saying I I is true, but how come it seems, it appears, to happen immediately after sex imbalances have reached some kind of a plateau? Why not before? Why not later? Why not 10 years later, 20 years later? Everything that you mentioned didn't start exactly to have some influence 10 years uh, when the sex ratio at birth was at its highest level. It was already in process, ongoing, 10 years earlier, um, sometimes 20 years earlier, sometimes 10 years later. So how come there is this coincidence 
That's why uh, we have a feeling that there is a cycle. Otherwise, maybe in some country we might see some kind of stabilization with skewed sex ratio at birth for 20 years or 30 years before these many factors finally have some impact. But apparently, they all have impact just after five years or 10 years. So there seems to be, to me, a built-in mechanism of you know, self-correction doesn't mean much, but, and that's where I recognize endogeneity. Otherwise, there would be no link. And people who have worked, for example, on South Korea, have mentioned the, 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 the importance of uh, increasing access to employment by women. But it was not exactly during the mid-1990s. It started earlier. And so how come in the mid-1990s it had some impact, some bearing on sex imbalances? So the same question would be repeated for other countries where it is a few years after reaching the maximum level that something happens. Why not before? And so you would have almost no sex imbalances at birth, or why not later? And then you would have sex imbalances over a very long period. And that's what we don't see. Like the system seems to be unstable. Otherwise, it would have stayed longer, which may be the case for China. But again, we have issues with um, estimation for China because a lot of people fail to, to uh, register um, female births in order to artificially reduce the family size. So yeah, there was some bias in, in China. Um, but still, in China, it stayed at a high level for more than 15 years. But after a while, well, guess what? Started to decline, you know? Like, uh, now I can say every, every, like every, everywhere else. So that's where, you know, I see some endogeneity. And the issue with endogeneity is that it's very difficult to find the built-in mechanism by which you know, uh, a, a demographic regime would self-correct. But I've given, I think, a couple of other examples of demographic uh, self-correction after a crisis or after uh, some change, uh, exogenous change in technology or in political system or economic environment. But anyway, uh, I welcome uh, a further conversation with you. Thank you. distressed, that you see it inevitable, that uh, it will go up, it will come down, but we are dealing with millions of crimes. So it's not uh, something which is uh, uh, a small number of uh, small incidents, it's very large. And you know, in your talk you talk about North India, what about South India? Why don't you see what's happening in South India, the spread in South India, in Eastern India? Does it not bother you? Does it, I mean, I mean, you know, for you, it seems that nothing can be done. I don't see it that dismal. Oh. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm sorry, Sabu, if I gave you this uh, uh, impression. Uh, I think the um, the change uh, can be, in fact, accelerated. Uh, by policy intervention, and uh, that there are many measures to either um, um, fasten the decline in sex imbalances at birth, and also maybe to mitigate uh, its impact. Uh, what I wanted to stress in this presentation is the fact that you see regular patterns everywhere in the world. It doesn't mean that we what we, that we don't have to do anything. In fact, uh, the, the, the policy schemes of built-in factors, in my uh, understanding of the process, that accelerate the return to normalcy. So they play a role. But they are endogenous 
to a large extent because they've been caused by the by the, the disruption of the sexual at birth in the first place. What uh, worries me, like when I look at the state of Kerala, 40, 50, 60 years it resisted sex selection distortions, but now we are seeing distortions there. And even at ultra low fertilities, we are not looking at what you are talking about, East, I mean, Eastern Asia, or, you know, we are looking at uh, declines, even much lower declines causing uh, distortions and sex ratios at birth. I had an impact on the sex ratio selection. You know, we find that a lot of child marriages are taking place, women, girl child is neglected, and uh, do you think it had any impact all over the world, all over the world, including China and India? Thank you. That's a question I've been discussing uh, with Paul Emile, a student uh, sitting behind you, uh, just uh, half, uh, um, a few hours ago. We are trying to figure out the exact impact of uh, COVID crisis in India on gender uh, discriminatory practices, not only sex selection, but many other dimensions. And um, so he's going to work on it, and within three months we, will, we should we should know everything, but this is the right question. I'm sorry we don't have the right answer at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph, for a very stimulating talk. The questions I have or comments relate to your conclusion, in a sense, depends on how one would explain the nonlinear movement in the um, SRBs. And the thing about nonlinear trends is, of course, one of the reasons they're nonlinear are that they are multiple factors. Sometimes factors we may see, we may not see, or factors which we club together and we need to take apart. And clubbing that with what you rightly point out, that you know, people who are living in these contexts aren't demographers, they aren't uh, necessarily uh, thinking of a possible different future from what they've seen all around them. So I was wondering if one was to break apart some of those factors, and then one might come to what would be the difference between some of these global trends. Maybe they won't play out everywhere. And thinking of India in particular, one of the things which I think uh, would help, and some of us have been arguing, is that rather than just take some preference, if we think of daughter aversion as not just the counter of son preference and see how these trends have led to a daughter aversion and what is it that might lead to a change. Now, <clears throat> there, for example, in the Indian context, we again have that it doesn't matter that property laws have changed, there's people make sure that women don't inherit. Uh, it doesn't matter that they're anti-dowry laws. People all believe that their daughters won't be affected and they will give high dowries and continue to push them. They all talk about how it's so difficult to get brides, but they all believe that India being this vast nation, they will get brides from somewhere else. And that becomes a factor there. Um, so, you know, one could, if one was to break these down and see which are the factors which either endogenously through the sex ratios sort of falling under its own weight, the imbalance falling under its own weight, or other factors might change. We might actually uh, uh, bring in that maybe we will continue to have outliers to these global trends. You know, people's hopes for the future are often, in terms of labor, you know, women have been losing employment more than men. In terms of uh, families thinking that sons are useless, but still hope that the sons will come back to support them. How do we counter in these subjective factors through which practices play out? One last thing, in terms of policy in the Indian context, 
what we have to keep in mind is that something like Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao is actually only a new name for a long, uh, uh, you know, for a much longer set of policy prescriptions which was supposedly addressing daughter aversion, though they did not talk about it. And what it brings us to then is actually that moving, taking steps for daughter's employment, um, education, is how it doesn't seem to be helping. So what are the other structures? And finally, we come to what seems like an impossible situation, that there's structural transformations, which some of these other countries actually maybe went through, you know, or already had in place, were forgotten and kicked back in. For example, in terms of health, in terms of old age pensions, things like that. So, basically asking for that non-linear to be more uh, sort of uh, analyzed in more with the nitty gritties. Thanks. Oh, the voice. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I'll respond to Rajni. Well, uh, yes, um, thank you, but how do we go about that, you know? Uh, if we unpack, uh, for instance, uh, patriarchal practices or kinship constraints, um, that sounds fine, but we don't have really the indicators, you know, about how people perceive, anticipate, and uh, we, we, we have a vague feeling, sometimes we hear conversation, but we don't know how these things have changed over the last 10 years or 20 years. That's, for instance, something which is very puzzling to me is that I thought that uh, the forthcoming merit squeeze, the mounting uh, shortage of brides, would be the main explanation. But then how long does it take? It takes at least 20 years, you know, to be felt. It takes for sex imbalances to convert into shortage uh, missing brides. But sometimes the change has taken less than 25 years. So how come? I mean, again, the question is that pe did people really foresee what was coming on, what was uh, uh, coming? And uh, so here we need, uh, yeah, we need you. We need sociologists and anthropologists, you know, to tell us how, how people react and how people make uh, their uh, family decisions and are able to, 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 to adjust to uh, I, I find it pretty remarkable, in fact, the capacity of people to adjust. For the policy adjustment, I think it's more uh, expected, even if it was very difficult for governments to design policies on something they never uh, fought against in the past with no experience. So, um, but apart from that, it was expected that government would react, but that families and people are reacting in a way, very fast. I mean, in some countries, it may not be the case, as I said, for China, for instance, but still it was a pretty rapid change that it, you shouldn't ask uh, somebody like me who deals with large numbers. We should ask social scientists who do uh, uh, field studies and who are able to get a sense of the changing perspective of families about their future and the, the role and the place of daughters within the family, which is happening right now. Can I ask, I mean, how do you prepare indices? I wouldn't know. Don't work with indices much. But I was wondering if in each of these cases which you've looked at, where have you seen sort of particular conjunctions of these various factors which lead to nonlinear trends? So often if it's conjunctions rather than how did policy affect here, 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 but in this particular context, policy with X, Y, Z. And so that those seem to explain maybe the plateau, maybe the decline, I don't know if any such exercise you've tried. 
uh, I've tried many things, but nothing actually worked. So I'm sorry to report. And um, but I'm still looking for the some clue. Huh? So be my guest if you have any specific uh, <laughs> uh, idea. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor Gulmoto. That lecture was extremely insightful. Um, just something I was curious to hear your thoughts on may not relate very squarely to what we discussed today, but um, the overall hypothesis of how this is going to stabilize, um, if you look at overall sex ratio and you gave us evidence as to how it played out, but if we start looking at conditional sex ratios at birth, where we see that with the second and the third birth order, because of the sex of the initial children, we've seen how dramatically it drops, like in the Indian context down to the third birth order from the 900s, it goes down to the 700s, which is also where that factor of sun preference plays out the most out of the three factors that we discussed. Against that backdrop, and then considering the fertility squeeze and the increasingly small family sizes that we are talking about, um, do you then see that we may in fact be experiencing a trend that is different because with smaller family sizes, the sun preference that otherwise was sort of coming to the forefront only at the third birth order where the first two were daughters, where families now want only one children, that may end up being more pronounced. Do you think we've seen some results to that extent that will give us the confidence that we'll be following this trend or are we yet to see what the impact of that is going to be? Thanks. Uh, in, in fact, there are a couple of countries in uh, East uh, Asia where we see um, prenatal discrimination uh, from the first birth. That is true, uh, for instance, in China and in Vietnam. So here I would say people really take no chance. Right from the first pregnancy, they are, are trying to manage and to control the gender composition to make sure that they have one boy. That's something that we don't observe in, uh, in the rest of the world, you know, especially not in India. Now, in India, people who have uh, only one child should, in fact, be uh, those who manipulate the first birth. But as it, it has been shown, um, for instance, uh, by my colleague uh, Ravinder, uh, it's mostly people who, from the middle class that are now uh, having a more, uh, co a more uh, natural sex ratio, precisely the same people who have a lower number of births. So we are talking about the same subpopulation. So the, the Weakening of sun preference is happening among, say, urban middle class, if that's okay with, with you, Rajni, if it's a very, um, maybe too simple uh, characterization. A and precisely these are people, maybe a lot of them in this room, who have only one child and who have more balanced uh, gender practices and for which uh, kinship constraints or kinship rules are more um, gender neutral you know, towards both sides of the, of the family. So uh, that's why I think we are not going to see that uh, in, in India right now. And we see sex selection still mostly concentrated for the third and sometimes also for the second birth. So that's where changes are going to happen, uh, 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 as far as I'm able to, to predict. So thanks, Christoph. Uh, lots of food for thought as usual. I will just uh, maybe make a few small points, but also uh, link and respond to what other people have said. Uh, so let me begin by just the marriage squeeze thing that we are discussing. Or uh, rather, let me begin with what you alluded to about uh, what I've discussed in one of my papers about the emerging middle class and the middle class. So that paper was really pointing out that uh, <clears throat> the population that 
tends to select, uh, sex select heavily is a upwardly mobile emerging middle class, you know, which is keen to get ahead for them having sons, more sons or only sons still makes a lot more sense. And as people move into what in that paper I'd called a stable middle class, uh, then by then they're more educated. Hopefully that makes a difference to their gender preferences. And the fertility uh, is already declining, as you said, you know, this room would be representative and people are not go will not discriminate uh, on the basis of gender as much. So that was um, one aspect. But your <laughs> question about the marriage squeeze, you know, that, that you presume that that would be a very important possible factor resulting in a turnaround uh, that... Uh, you know, a couple of things about that. I know my own focus has been a lot on that. But uh, as Rajni pointed out, you know, you can, people think they can always get brides from elsewhere. So one feature of the marriage squeeze, as we know, is that overall, maybe it's not um, in such great numbers that it's, except it's very localized, you know, for example, Haryana and uh, some places in Gujarat or Rajasthan or, and places have gone up and down, uh, you know, where the marriage squeeze is worse or is improved. UP is ideally said to have the worst marriage squeeze going forward. Punjab, Haryana have already passed that stage. So, but, uh, but as we've seen, you know, it's, now, it's palpable where it's happening, but even the people to whom it is happening think it's not a big deal and they should be able to import brides uh, from any part of the country and earlier from Bangladesh and Nepal, etc. Same as happened in China, happened in South Korea, happened in many other countries. So I don't know to what extent, uh, you know, the marriage squeeze by itself can uh, become a a factor that would uh, people would take into their calculations of having daughters or sons or not having. But you know, the old theory about costs of raising children often works when we talk about fertility. And then the gendered costs or, or the costs of children is what we always talk about when we talk about uh, the imbalance in the sex ratios. The other question, you know, related to this is, uh, I know in India, the percentage of uh, non-marriage is statistically still very small. In other places, that is changing rapidly. And changing gender and sexuality, gender, you know, sexual preferences and things like that. I know that question has been raised in the context, uh, context of China, also resorting more to um, non-marital sex, you know, whether it's commercial sex or other kinds of things. So those are other factors. You also know the literature as well as I do that people have talked about. Uh, so what the point uh, I'm making is that, you know, maybe marriage squeeze for various reasons does not factor very palpably into how people think about, uh, you know, going about uh, composing, uh, you know, the gender uh, gender composition of their families. So one was that. Second, I think Rajini often preempts me in uh, various <laughs> thoughts and questions. But um, we huh? We just think together. <laughs> <laughs> but you know your big question about why would son preference fade away? And I agree, you know, with Sabu that in India it's like a moving, movable scene. Things are do getting worse somewhere, things are getting better somewhere, etc., etc. But overall, you, you know, the figures show us a kind of a flat picture. But the flat picture might hide all these complexities. And so I think what Sabu is raising is, you know, should we then not forget about it and not try to do anything about it. But I wanted to ask you, you know, a question that connects more with what Rajini said. Why should we look for a homogeneous one theory? Which, because, you know, I understand what is worrying you. you. We have all these examples from different parts of the world and we have all these factors that we have to contend with, which don't allow us to... Uh, we could say, yes, there were three 
a confluence of three things that led to the horrible, let's say in the Indian context, we call it decline in sex ratios. The rest of the world calls it rise. We can identify that, you know, that low fertility decline, new technologies and uh, uh, sun preference, you know, were brought together. So, uh, but why should we look, you know, because uh, for a homogeneous theory, because the point is that whenever even the work we did in five states, it showed the importance of contextual factors you know, in, uh, in, in a turnaround um, <clears throat> or, or in whatever the picture was, whether the decline or whether the turnaround. And I know this, uh, so, so why is it not that we identify a confluence of factors? And they may not be stable and remain stable all the time. So, uh, different places, because you pointed out, you know, there are different kinship and marriage systems. If laws are being introduced, they are affecting things at some time or later, etc. Um, so, why, why not look for more contextual uh, factors? And I don't know, you know, as sociologists, where we, uh, what we are poor at is being able to do uh, econometrics like the econo economists or, um, or the, the kind of work that demographers do. But in terms of, I think one big story could be around the shifting value of daughters to parents. And that's something that we need to map. But um, I think we would need sociologists, demographers and economists all together trying to do that. Some, I've done some of the qualitative work on that. And there is, you know, again, it's not so simple. I mean, in China, very palpably, more and more families, I've read a lot of the qualitative literature on that, are saying that girls are just fine. We prefer daughters. You know, for the son, you have to get a house before you can marry him. You are not sure whether they'll support you or not, etc., etc. A lot of papers on the disaffection with sons. And the Indian case also, I think there is, uh, the scene is changing. I think as Bina mentioned that, you know, families are not necessarily um, uh, patri-local in the physical sense. They're not staying together. Uh, the support issues their sons could still be supporting from afar or could not be supporting. Daughters could be running to parents every two months, uh, if possible. Sons are not doing that as far as I can see that. So there is some sort of, if not disaff disaffection, there is uh, a sense that uh, you can't rely on sons in the old ways that you used to be able to do. And I know that, you know, just from uh, mapping around one, one can see that there is a lot of support uh, that daughters are offering. But again, just like the question on the marriage squeeze, my question would be, is it sufficient enough for people not to r rely on uh, or, you know, thinking that a daughter is good enough now? I don't really need to have a son. Um, you know, I don't know if you remember, that was Matthias Larson who talked about sun necessity. To what extent sun necessity is decreasing. So maybe leaving son preference aside, leaving daughter aversion aside, we could also the question, ask the question if son necessity as such is uh, declining. But it would be good to maybe for all of us to come together again and think through some of these questions more concretely. Anyway, so, but you know, Lauren, last thing, I was just reading on South Korea recently and uh, pat, pat, patriarchy hasn't gone anywhere. You know, there are revolts right now uh, happening in South Korea by women as to, uh, you know, lack of support uh, in household health, lack of support from the state and and the expectation, and they are saying we are not baby-making machines, don't expect us to. So that there's a more complicated story from the time that Monica wrote about it there as well, and we don't know where that goes. Sorry for taking Thank you very much. much. Uh, I think I'm afraid uh, we'll have to uh, conclude this session because we have uh, there's a time constraint also here.
So yes. may I briefly respond yes, to yes, please do. some of uh, um, Ravinder's question? Because, first of all, uh, for those of uh, you who don't know us, uh, the two of us have been uh, discussing for the last 15 years. <laughs> so it's an ongoing conversation. And, um, okay, so well, there is one point. Uh, of course, uh, you are perfectly right to insist on the, 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 the role of contextual factors. And I'm not going to deny it. But I'm trying to, to find something common in mechanism that seems to be replicated everywhere. So it may not be at some micro level, it may not be true, but at a national or sometimes regional level, that's what we see. So we should expect the same kind of mechanism being at play. And that's what I'm looking at, I mean, looking for. And it may be a confluence of different factors, but um, I'm still trying to find the, 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 the alchemy uh, or the chemistry of this uh, combination that results in that. And I think it's very important also because they are countries that are looking for solutions. So we should be able also to tell them, look, these set of factors are known to be effective in accelerating the downturn. So yes, we need a contextual understanding, but what I'm doing here by comparing different countries is trying to find a common ground um, in, in Europe or Asia. Or, and that's why also I'm comparing with Europe's uh, 19th century. Uh, um, uh, yes, import, I mean, bride, import of bride uh, is a solution. But as you know, it's not the preferred solution. And it's not perfect. And it doesn't work very smoothly. Uh, and there is sometimes a lot of abuse and violence involved. So it's not a long-term uh, solution. And uh, in addition, uh, at some point, there will be no, no more brides to import. One brides have to be imported by larger states, like, say, uh, Uttar Pradesh. Then um, there will be no um, the arithmetic works against this uh, solution. And um, yes, there are many alternative arrangements to marriage, but so far, nothing stable or nothing, I mean, commercial or sex, for instance, is not a long-term solution. It's a short-term solution, but to build up a, a family, it, it won't work. Um, now, uh, there is, uh, uh, regarding the, the, the status of daughters uh, within the family, which is changing, I think there is a a great tension between the normative and the practical consideration or attitudes of people. Because the normative, I mean, there is pressure to have sons and for sons to reproduce, on the, to perpetuate the family. So that's a normative environment. Now, practical considerations are that daughters very often uh, offer real uh, emotional or financial support to their parents, that's obvious. So, so there is a tension here, and the way it's going to be reconciled will take definitely some, some years, or if not decades, and it will imply a change in the kinship system, whereby uh, women will be, um, I mean, daughters will be uh, recognized on par with, with boys. But that's not exactly the situation. And even if uh, Binagarwal was talking about uh, inheritance, I think it was Rajni who was saying that anyway it's not implemented because people don't want to have it and that's something we hear also in Eastern Europe and they say yeah we have equal inheritance but I mean daughters uh, or, or sisters will renounce spontaneously on uh, their share of the inheritance and give it to their brothers for 
you know. Uh, so, um, so there is that tension between norms and, uh, um, uh, and actual uh, behavior. Uh, and, um, and yes, bacteriocal norms, like you were mentioning about South Korea, are going to persist. And I'm not surprised because I'm French and we do have bacteriocal norms uh, very much. It's part of the family environment. But at least in terms of it has no impact on uh, gender uh, preference, so it's just uh, another part of the of the story, as I see it. Thank you, anyway. Uh, I must say thanks to all of you, and thanks, of course, to Christophe Kielmont. Uh We've had a really stimulating and interesting, and I, what is. Uh, what was uh, good about it is that we have had so many experts who have been working in the field and uh, have adding their uh, expertise and uh, experience to the discussion on this. Uh, I'm afraid I, I cannot ask, more, uh, ask for more questions because I think we have already getting a, a little signal from outside saying that it's time that we, we wind up. I think... Uh, well, I request uh, Renu Adlaka to give a vote of thanks to all of you, and thanks once again for all of you for being present. Thank you. So um, I'm going to take this opportunity not only to give a vote of thanks, which I will, but just two observations which came to me uh, in the course of the presentation and the discussion. One was how actually uh, this the presentation and the discussion was more a dialogue between different disciplines. Not only a dialogue among experts who know each other, as we saw from the first name references, but also among you know, uh, demographers, sociologists, anthropologists, and economists. So I think that was a very enriching part of the uh, the event in which uh, Professor Giomoto, uh, as he clearly stated, spoke from the loca location of a demographer. And uh, for him, the numbers show the trend and how uh, the discussion brought in a lot of the qualitative elements that um, you know uh, other social scientists always bring into discussions around numbers. So uh, that's uh, was very enlightening. And secondly, because of my own interest, I just have to mention this, that today the presentation was on prenatal sex selection. But prenatal selection also encompasses uh, what we may call disability selective selection. And with the developments now that are moving in the area of STEM, it's going to be highly you know, in the next couple of years, next couple of years, couple of decades, we are going to have more and more prenatal selection of different characteristics apart from sex as the technology moves. And how that will interface with gender is something that uh, really, uh, you know, is thought provoking. So I'd like to thank, uh, firstly, I have many people to thank, and I'm going to thank each of them. I'd first like to thank the executive uh, of the CWDS, and particularly Professor Mohan Rao, who suggested uh, Professor Giamato to deliver the JP Nayak lecture. And then I'd like to thank all my colleagues at CWDS, the faculty, the admin, the accounts, and others who helped organize this event, and also for uh, to Professor Vasanti uh, Raman, the chairperson, for chairing the event. And now uh, we invite you to have tea with us. Thank you. Thank you very much.